Welcome to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? I'm Erin Summers. I'm a sports broadcaster that's covered the Atlantic Coast Conference for a very long time, and I grew up a fan. I've always been curious what players do after we obsess over them in college. This podcast answers that question. Each week, you'll hear an interview with a former ACC athlete. We'll find out everything they've been doing since playing in college. Thanks for listening. Let's jump in to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? This week, I'm joined by former Duke forward Lee Melchioni. Melchioni played from 2002 to 2005 and helped Duke to an ACC tournament championship in his senior season. Here's our conversation. Now, Lee, you spent a lot of time in Durham, but where are you now and what are you doing? So I live in Atlanta, Georgia now, and I'm an attorney, but more on the finance side of things, so I don't necessarily really practice law, but work on tax mitigation vehicles for contingency fee attorneys and definitely takes more than 30 seconds to explain, but definitely something that most folks do not want to hear about. So we can move on from there. Definitely sounds like you used your Duke education. (laughs) Speaking of Duke, you were in the 2002 recruiting class there. That was JJ Reddick, Sean Dockery, Shav Randolph, and Oh, Sheldon Williams. And Mike Thompson. Yeah, so it was a pretty um, highly touted recruiting class, and you come in deciding to come in as a walk-on. What made you decide that that was the best opportunity for you, despite the fact that you could have gone someplace else and played a ton right away? Mm -hmm. For me, I was raised on Duke. You know, I had taken the blue pill from a very young age. My father played at Duke. At that time, I was in high school. My sister was a student at Duke. So, you know, if, uh, if Duke recruited me, which they did, even though I was essentially had to walk on for, for a year, I was going to go there. And um, you know, obviously, I had no regrets. It's an incredible opportunity academically and athletically. And the relationships that I built there and continue to maintain to this day are something that I cherish. So, um, obviously, a bit of a unique situation where it could have gone somewhere else. That, uh, full scholarship and played right away but the decision I made to do was was one of the best decisions I've ever made. At that time going in playing at a school that was such a high caliber basketball program as Duke what were some of your goals and aspirations as an incoming student athlete? Mm-hmm. I think when I committed to Duke and you and you first when you're watching them on tv in your high school, you think literally. I had these thoughts to myself. I was like, "Oh, everybody that plays at Duke goes to the NBA. I'm going to play in the NBA." And then you you quickly arrive on campus and realize, well, like that likely that is probably not happening. <laughs> so yeah, when I got there and you're practicing against Dante Jones every day, who's kicking my ass. Um, then you know, then sophomore year we bring in Luol Dang and then Chris Humphries and Sean Livingston were supposed to probably be at that class. So my, my goal is quickly changed to what can I do to just get on the court here and be a part of this team and uh, you know help us win in any way, shape, or form. And thankfully, you know, essentially during my, my junior year, an opportunity arose and was, was able to play a fair amount my junior and senior year. You mentioned everyone's dream is to play in the NBA. When you realize that might not be a possibility, how difficult was it to – shift your mindset and kind of reassess where you were at? Mm -hmm. I I think I knew that my future was most likely in business. And I think that the opportunities and individuals, other students that you meet at Duke uh, can really open your eyes to other opportunities out there. I had an internship between my junior and senior year at Credit Suisse on Wall Street, which was uh, you know, welcome to the real world. You know, you got to be on the desk by 6 a.m. every day. You're there until essentially they tell you you can leave, you know, 7, 8 p.m. So um, I think that being at Duke was just a precursor of, of, of kind of setting yourself in standards for the rest of your life, your professional adult career. Um, but again, you know, help, help set the baseline for, for, for the rest of my life. Incredibly grateful for it. What are some of those standards that you learned while playing at Duke that you took into your business career? Sure. I think that attention to detail, um, you know, incredible work ethic, 
being a part of something bigger than yourself, um, you know, a team working towards a common goal, and then just the the mindset that you're going to do whatever it takes to get something done. So whether that means staying late, getting early, whatever you have to do to accomplish the goal is is what must be done. While you were at Duke, you were a part of four ACC championship teams and made a Final Four appearance. Mm -hmm. What were those experiences like to be a part of? Sure, I joke that you know, if you go to Duke and don't win a national championship, it's almost like you <laughs> didn't play there. But uh, Especially with all the people all that you had while you were there. I, I know, I know. And, um, and obviously you being a Carolina grad, you guys got one <laughs> during your time, but, um, which is even harder to stomach. But uh, <laughs> no, I think, you, you know, as you look back, you remember, it's I think, you know, you definitely remember the ACC tournament championships and then certain nuances of games that we lost in the NCAA tournament sometimes I say bother you right but stick with you I think um, my sophomore year playing UConn up seven minutes or up seven points with less than a minute to go and we lose that game and we would have played Georgia Tech in the final who I think we've beaten three times that year so things like that stick with you a little bit you know even though I didn't I didn't really play much wasn't necessarily a part of would have been a part of the, the victory but um, so I mean, listen, you, you're, it's good stories to tell. And obviously you, you cannot win. There can only be one champion every year. But, um, yeah, some of those losses, you definitely think about shots you could have made or things you could have done differently in games like that, especially when it's a, you know, you only have four shots at this, four cracks to win a national championship. And unfortunately, um, came up short. It's a very natural thing to ruminate. Everybody does it. You sit there and you replay all the – the bad decisions that you made or the things that should have gone another way. Yeah. As a basketball player, it's funny that you mentioned that you do the same thing. How often do those moments, those thoughts come back to your mind now? I mean, I, I don't know. I think less right now that I, you're busy. I'm, I'm, I'm married. I have two kids. So you got a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. But there are times when I'm watching the game or you go back to Cameron or during the NCAA tournament when I think of, you know, certain things that stand out in my mind, like had they gone differently, would would we have won that game or situations like that? But um, I guess it's it gets it's it gets easier slightly. You know, every every year that passes, you remember a little less. Um, so but yeah, you're right. It's a it's natural and it uh, it still hurts a little bit. You did get a lot of playing time your junior, senior seasons, about 20 minutes a game. You had 19 starts when it was all said and done. You averaged seven points your junior and senior seasons. So how were you able to kind of maybe overachieve expectations as a walk-on coming in? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder because, you know, people are like, oh, you know, you're going to do the walk-on. I, yeah, I was um, – you know, a top 100 recruit recruited by you know, schools all over the country. So, you know, my, my sense was that I, I came to Duke to play and to compete. And I felt like, you know, whether it was arrogantly, you know, I did I potentially deserved an opportunity to play my, my freshman and sophomore year. Obviously, I am not going to argue with Coach K. He's had a little bit <laughs> of success in his day as a coach. But once I felt like once I was given the opportunity my, my junior year that um, – yeah, I was going to make it so that it was an integral part of the team. And so that, you know, essentially I was going to play from that point forward. And, you know, so, yeah, I just felt like the ability to compete, play harder than other people and be in incredible shape and do whatever it took to, to get on the floor. You know, those were my goals, essentially my junior and senior year. You mentioned Coach K. He has a great track record as far as coaching goes. What is something that, he taught you that you've held on to? Sure. I think one thing that stands out about coach to me is as you go through life, you run into people who the majority of people do not practice what they preach. They may say one thing, but then as you get to know them, they do or live their life another way. And with coach, he's one of the very few people that everything he says or does he he feels at the highest level and absolutely lives by a set of standards that he doesn't compromise for anybody or anything and I have 
the utmost respect and hold him in the highest regard for that. And I think that, <clears throat> you know, seeing him and watching him do that is something that, you know, I try to emulate in my own life is, is, um, is to be a genuine individual and, and practice what you preach. You did mention that I'm a Carolina grad, but I too have found a way to respect Coach K and what he does. He is very good at coaching at all levels. So it's, it's kind of hard to deny that. As you approached your senior season, the end of your senior season, what were some of the decisions that you had to make about your next step after college? Sure, sure. So um, I think at that point, I decided I still wanted to you know, pursue basketball and you know, had an opportunity to play overseas. Um, and so, you know, I felt like the I, I had lunch with a, an NBA agent who actually represented uh, J.J. Redick and Sheldon Williams, who I ended up working for um, uh, after I got done playing. So, you know, listen, beggars can't be choosers. So I, I wasn't necessarily a uh, sought after European player, but was was an incredible opportunity and thankful that I was was able to play overseas and, and, and be a professional for a year. You played in Italy. How different was that experience from playing here in the United States? Sure. So the when you play at Duke, you're 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 at you know it's thought of as the top of the best basketball programs in the country. And that's when you go overseas, it's almost like, this is no disrespect to Rose, but you're almost taking a step down in terms of facilities, how you travel, attendance, um, all these things. Um, and uh, sometimes it can be, be a rude awakening and you realize, you realize quickly how spoiled and how good you had it at Duke. How rude are we talking? What were the facilities like, the travel experience? Sure. I mean, listen, you, at Duke, we we took one commercial flight. That was my freshman year when we went to London for a fall break uh, to do a little bit of a tour. Other than that, we were on you know private jets. We took the Rolling Stones jet out to California <laughs> my freshman year for the NCAA tournament. You know, we actually at, at that time at Duke we didn't have a practice facility, so we shared a um, you know essentially we shared it the uh, um, Cameron with wrestling, women's basketball, fencing, and lots of things, but uh, you know, when you go overseas to Italy, you're, you're practicing in like a, a rec center gym. Someone else is sweeping the floor before the game. You know, you have one trainer, uh, you're, you're traveling around in a bus. You're certainly not, I mean, we flew some places, but you're on a commercial flight. So just not night and day, but definitely different from, mm -hmm. uh, from what you're used to at Duke. After that season that you played in Italy, you decided to take a completely different turn, but still stay in the sports world. What was the progression from basketball to the business career like for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, listen, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Part of me wishes I would have would have played. I had the opportunity to would have played, you know, three to five, seven years longer. But at that time, my view was. I knew my future was in business, not in basketball. And I didn't want to come back to the United States at 30 years old to an entry level position. So the transition for me was an incredible opportunity to work at, at that time, it's called Wasserman Media Group, called Wasserman today, no real difference, but, and work with one of the top agents, some of the godfather of agents in Arn Tellum. And so the transition for me was, you know, you're, you're still involved in sports, you're still involved in basketball, you're just on a, on the business side of it now. Um, and with, with some advice, some other folks you know, went to law school at night while working full time, which was you know, insane, incredibly difficult. But again, one of the best decisions I've, decisions I've ever made and incredibly grateful that I did that as well. Time management. I'm sure you learned a little bit about that while playing at Duke. How much did that help you in juggling everything that you had going on while you were living there in LA? Sure. Yeah. I think, listen, there's a lot of distractions as a young person in LA and having to go to school and work, I think you really just, you cut out a lot of that, cut out a lot of fun and just focus on what you need to get done. 
And it's similar to being back in college when you have, you know, several hours of practice, weights, conditioning on top of, on top of class. So again, it's one of the situations where you do what you got to do uh, to get it done. Any big names that you represented while you were there with Wasserman? Yeah, I think as, I mean, as a company, of course, names you everyone's heard of Russell Westbrook, Derek Rose, Joe Johnson, the Gasol brothers, Al Horford, you know, guys I specifically work with, uh, Marcus Smart, Kendrick Perkins, Danilo Gallinari, um, you know, great guys, genuine people. And, uh, yeah, it's in, definitely an interesting industry. Yeah, how much did you enjoy being on that side of it versus when you played? Yeah, I think, listen, it's, when you're on the playing side or playing at Duke, you know, everyone coddles you, right? You're essentially babysat everything's done <laughs> for you and going to the reverse side of it where you're, you're servicing these guys and providing them guidance and these things and helping them in their career. So I think, listen, everything's a transition, but at the same time, having gone through it, obviously I didn't play in the NBA, but having gone through some of these things, you know, you're able to provide some value to them, hopefully, um, in throughout their careers. You don't have to name any names, but what was the craziest thing that you had to take care of on the agent side? Yeah, uh, I should probably not say that on camera. I mean, there are definitely some things, <laughs> some requests that come in. Um, some some weird ones. I learned one one thing that I can share. I learned a lot about time frames and temperatures that you can ship dogs on a commercial flight, of which pretty useless information, but I, I know a fair amount about this. So. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely some different information that you have filed away yeah. for maybe future use if you need it. When exactly. you were done with working there, kind of how did you decide that you were done being an agent and you wanted to move on to the next phase. Yeah, I think the, um, was offered an opportunity, a close friend who worked at us trust, which is now the private bank, a bank of America and an opportunity arose there, um, which was a, you know, it's a good transition time for me. And essentially is you know, similar type skills in terms of private banking, wealth management, and it just feels time for, for a change. And so the transition to that was, was relatively smooth. And, um, you know, given the similar type sales background, uh, you know, felt like it was a, a good transition and, and relatively easy one to make. So is that where you are now or was that a step in between? That was a step in between. So then, um, and now currently, you know, in Atlanta doing, uh, putting my, my law degree to work, but essentially not, not practicing law, but more on the litigation finance side of things. How has your goals or your aspirations changed throughout each phase of your career? Kind of what's at the top of your list as far as what you would like to achieve now? Mm -hmm. I think uh, as you get older as a person, I think your, your priorities change when you're younger, you're selfish. And there's only one person in your life you're concerned about is, is yourself. And I think as you grow, you're older, as you get married and have kids, you essentially live for your kids. So I think for me, it's been very blessed to have happy, healthy children and you want to provide for them. Uh, I think and be, be fulfilled in the rest of your life. You know, I enjoy, uh, at least I enjoyed pre COVID getting up and coming to work every mm -hmm. day. Um, but um, no, it's, it's been great. Enjoy my professional career and translating things that I learned on the basketball court at Duke from coach K into my professional life. And, um, and yeah, back to your original question, just, I think you want your, your kids to have a better life than, than you had. And I, I feel like I had a pretty good life growing up. So no complaints there. Are you staying in Atlanta for a while? I don't know. I've moved around for a fair amount. I, I enjoy Atlanta. It's nice to be back in the South. It's close to, to Durham and all those things. And uh, it's a great city. We, uh, we really enjoy living here. And uh, so short answer, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> a typical day in the life of Lee Melchione, what does it look like? Well, it's I get up. It's just, it's just interesting. So I get up early, typically feed my youngest between like 536. If I can stay up, I get a workout in. These days go ride the Peloton, do a workout in the basement. <laughs> um, spend some time with the boys in the morning before they typically went to daycare. 
work, um, come home, spend another hour, hour and a half with the boys, try to do bedtime, bath time, read some books. And then it is, um, you know, essentially try to keep my eyes open from dealing with my little two maniacs during the day uh, and work. So life is, I'd say it's pretty hectic, but it's pretty simple in that I have, you know, you've got work, you've got family time and then free COVID, I would, would travel a fair amount. But um, with all that being said, it's, it's been great. There's a, uh, there, it's what did you say, short days, long weeks or, or long, long days, short weeks, but it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's, yeah, life is good. No complaints. Across your entire basketball business career, who's been the most influential person for you? Sure. I've had, I've had several mentors in my life, obviously, I think starting with my parents and my father, you know, I think you just almost learned through osmosis watching their, you know, his work ethic and then on to, you know, my high school coaches. And obviously coach K played a significant role uh, in my life. And then some professional mentors that I worked for, you know, from, from Arn Tellum to, to other people um, in my life, business leaders that have really, that, um, just to allow you to pick their brain, talk about their path, their journey, and things that you, know, you may be struggling with or decisions that you're trying to decide. And you can bounce things off them and for them to having experienced it or, and be a sounding board for you and providing the sage advice, um, honest feedback to you is, is invaluable. So I've been lucky enough to have some, some great mentors and people like that in my life. How often do you still talk to Coach K or get back to Durham? Sure. So coach is great. You know, I think I, I try to talk to him a couple of times a year. Um, similar to, I think most families where they get together at, at the weddings and funerals, at Duke basketball is his final fours and uh, coach K Academy. So, you know, try to come back every summer to K Academy and get back to a few games during the year. Uh, try not to bother him during, during the year game days, but it's great to see him in the summer, catch up, give him a hug, um, see and see his entire family. And obviously because coach, and his entire family is the backbone, you know, the program, the, the, the constant that's remained the same. So going back there, it still gives me goosebumps to walk on campus. A couple more questions, kind of on the same thread there. You talked about Coach K, but who is your favorite teammate? You know, I, that's, that's a tough one. I, I loved, well, I think I love Daniel Ewing just because he was – Number one, this has nothing to do with basketball. He's just the essence of cool. He's just a <laughs> smooth operator, right? And just a great dude. I think underrated as a basketball player because he didn't, wasn't necessarily like rah, 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 snap. But he had a great, great career at Duke, great guy. And just um, everything about him was cool. So it's kind of an underrated answer. So are you saying that you weren't cool? Okay, I, don't, I mean, you know, I don't know. But, uh, no, I'm joking. Yeah, listen, there's, I think I'm comfortable in my own skin. And, like, there's certain levels of cool. Like, he was on another level than I was, for sure. So, I, I, I'm comfortable with that. You did become a fan favorite, though, with the Cameron Crazies. How were you able to win them over? I think, if, judging by this interview, you can see it's probably the subtle good looks and the boyish charm. <laughs> um, but, no, in all seriousness, I think – you know, my kind of energy and just kind of every man hustle endeared myself to the, the Duke student. And it's probably why you know, Duke students love me. And then other folks I run into now in my professional life, they're like, man, I hated you when you played for Duke. You are such a loser. Um, so, but it always makes me laugh. And they're probably right. I would have hated myself too if I was watching, you know, another. Uh, How often do you run into people that recognize you still? Uh, it's, it more so happens when they find out that I played at Duke or, you know, they kind of remember my name and they're like, man, mm-hmm. yeah, dude, folks who are my age range, like, yeah, I hated you. Uh, or, you know, you hear stories through friends, uh, but yeah, you know, it just makes me laugh. It's funny. It's, uh, it, it doesn't bother me at all. Yeah. I did read in your Duke basketball bio that your favorite athlete is Michael Jordan. How does I mean, he rank still? Come on, man. I think that's, that's like everybody's favorite athlete. This whole, this whole debate about who is the greatest of all time, the GOAT, 
to, to, to shorten it. I mean, I don't think it's a debate. I think it's basically just generational. Folks who grew up with LeBron watching him think that, and folks who really know who grew up with Michael realize that, you know, it's funny watching this documentary. As a kid, never once did I think watching him in the playoff series that they were going to lose. And it's such mm-hmm. an odd thing to have, but watching you look back, like, he, he, there's no doubt he's the, the best of all time. Yeah. Well, the last thing I want to know is you talked about the past, but where are you going to be in 10 years from now? I don't know. That's a, that's an interesting question. I don't have my, um, no, I married a fellow division one athlete, a volleyball player. So my, although my boys may play the flute and tuba, which I would be <laughs> totally fine with. I hope they, they develop into athletes and, and become thoroughbreds. But, you know, 10 years from now, hopefully would love to, to own my own company, be running something like that. And um, yeah, who knows? That's, a, that's a tough question. But yeah, uh, I would say owning my own company, running my own business would probably be a definitive goal of mine. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. It was fun yep. kind of getting to know more about your career and your path into where you're at now. No, awesome. Yeah, thanks for asking me. This is great. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you don't ever miss an episode of ACC Stars. Where are they now?